Good morning, everybody. Shalom. It's me again. It's good to see all of you. And today we're going to continue our studies in the series of uh, uh, growing in Christian character. Uh, last week we took a break from that series, but we are returning today. Now, uh, just to uh, say something before I get into the message proper, I had planned to open up uh, the passage on Matthew 21, uh, 28 to 32 for my text uh, on the 9th of August, but then I decided to skip it to keep the message short. So I will unpack this passage for us, a very short one, uh, Matthew 21, 28 to 32, uh, a parable. Now, however, before I do that, I wish to make a correction on an announcement I made last week regarding the future plan for our daily engagement series. Now, the current uh, two-month series uh, with the uh, theme of to stir, to season, and to serve will end 31st of August, uh, 2020. So it's ending very soon. You'll end with a La Coupe session in the morning of the uh, 31st August. And that La Coupe session will be with me. Now, I said last week that uh, we shall be uh, continuing with the engagement series, but on a much reduced scale. Well, uh, since then, we have come to uh, uh, rethink about it and decided to make a change. Uh, we, the staff team gave further thought and looked at the list of ideas, and there were lots of ideas, very wonderful ideas that we have uh, on hand already for the September, uh, perhaps in October onward, but we just felt that it's better to hold it all in the meanwhile and uh, just stop the initiative, the daily engagement initiative. So we, we thought that we could then all concentrate on adjusting to the hybrid service that we are starting uh, from the 6th of September. You know, hybrid meaning we have uh, on-site service, but at the same time supplemented by the online service on the same day. So uh, we have... Uh, as a result uh, of the daily engagement, in any case, establish a new line of communication with the entire church. Now, this line of communication, we are not going to uh, uh, dismantle it. In fact, we're going to maintain it and keep it available so that we can connect with our church members uh, if and when the need arises. So, that much for the correction on the announcement. Now, I think let us now commit the time to the Lord in prayer before we turn to the Word of God. Let us pray. Uh, Father, as we come before you and turn to your Word, we pray that you will just uh, anoint your Word and cause your Word to come alive to us. Lord, let it be living Word to us that can bring life, uh, can bring uh, nourishment, illumination uh, that will establish our faith. So we commit this time to you, Lord, uh, speak to us. Uh, we are listening because we pray all these things in Jesus' mighty name. And let all God's people say, Amen. All right. Passage, Matthew 21, 28 to 32. Uh, title of our, this is part five, uh, Learning uh, Obedience. But what do you think Jesus said? A man had two sons and he came to the first son and said, Son, go. Work today in my vineyard. He answered and said, I will not. But afterwards, he regretted it and went. Then he came to the second son and said, Likewise. And he said, I go, sir, I'll go. But he did not go. Jesus asked, Which of the two sons did the, did the will of his father? Then they answered, The first. Jesus said to them, Assuredly, I say to you that tax collectors and harlots enter the kingdom of God before you. For John came to you in a way of righteousness and you did not believe him. But tax collectors and harlots believe him. And when you saw it, you did not afterward relent and believe him. Let me give you an introduction and uh, share with you about this uh, strange flashback strange flashback. 
The parable we have just read is a very short one, and I have read it many, many times in the past. Uh, each time I read it, I would have a flashback. No, without fail, I'll have a certain flashback of an incident in my childhood, probably uh, in my primary three or primary four uh, year. It is a very strange recall from my memory bank because I cannot think of any special reason why it was that accident, uh, sorry, that incident that I recall of all the things that I could have recalled. If you think about it, actually, you would realize that you too have such strange, effortless, vivid recollection of certain childhood events. But I suppose it is one of those things that we cannot explain. Actually, we do not recall many incidents that happened in our younger days. But some of those that we can recall would be the ones indelibly uh, be imprinted in our memory. So what I'm going to share with you would be one such incident in my memory bank. But now I shall not start with that story because it's a bit narrow, it's personal, and it's a narrow story. I think it might be better for us to start with the big picture of the context of the parable. So moving on to the context of the parable. Now, the main subject of the parable is obedience. Now, Jesus was telling this parable to rebuke the Jews for refusing to obey God the Father. At the same time, Jesus was using the parable to commend the Gentiles for their response to God's call to salvation. The Jews were represented by the first son in the parable, and the Gentiles, or non-Jews, were represented by the second son in the uh, parable. Uh, the Jews, meaning the, the first son, they were the first to be called by God to be his special people. And the Jewish patriarch, uh, namely Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, they obeyed God. But subsequent generations of Jews were disobedient and they turned away from God. So they started with obedience, they ended in disobedience. See, the wayward generations of Jews could not see their rebelliousness, actually. They couldn't see it. They thought that they were okay. They thought that uh, they were favoured sons of God. And they were not aware of their disobedience. God sent prophets after prophets over the years to call them back to Him. But they refused to repent. The most recent one sent to them uh, at that time, a recent at that time, was John the Baptist. And he too was rejected by the Jews. And in the meanwhile, the Gentiles, represented by the second son in the parable, they were turning to God. They were responding to the preaching of John the Baptist. So we read John, uh, Matthew 21, 31, and hence the story, Jesus used the parable to pose the question, which of the two sons did the will of the Father. Which of the two sons did the will of the Father? Well, we can paraphrase or translate it this way. Who did according to the desire of his Father? Of the two sons, who did according to the desire of his Father? Who did to give pleasure to the Father? So it can be rendered that way. In the NLT, uh, verse 31 is rendered this way. Which of the two sons obeyed his father. That's in the New Living Translation. And, and that's why I uh, use it to illustrate uh, this whole issue of obedience. Obedience is actually expressed in more ways than just taking orders from somebody you must obey, more than just following rules so you must obey. Obedience in the context of Christian life is doing the will of the Father. It is to know the desire of the Heavenly Father. It is to do the things that would please the Father. Knowing all these things and then to act accordingly. That is how obedience is expressed. Now let me move on from the context of the parable to obedience and repentance. 
You see, we are still on the series on uh, character development, character growth. In, in our recent studies in the series, we touched on obedience being the key to character development. Well, obedience is a character quality, but it leads to the development of other character qualities. The Bible records the earthly life and ministry of Jesus and shows uh, how Jesus lived out this principle. Jesus was obedient. Jesus learned obedience. And it was learned in the crucibles of life, meaning he learns uh, through the uh, uh, training and trials, the sufferings and tribulations of, of life. And it is recorded in Hebrews 5, 8, uh, though Jesus was the Son of God, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered, you know, the crucibles of life. And throughout his earthly ministry, Jesus repeatedly said that uh, he did everything and would do only those things that, that, that God told him to do so. So he was acting in accordance to God's will all the time, in total obedience to Father God. And as we are reminded in this message, I think we should do well to follow in his footsteps. We learn obedience in the crucible of life. We learn obedience in our difficulties, in our sufferings. And I use the word sufferings here in a very loose and in a, a wide sense. Include uh, not, not just pain and suffering, but life experiences, uh, hardship. I, I, I glum them all out. And we have experienced this even in school where we were students at our workplace during training days, whether it's uh, university training, army training, work training, while serving others in our employment, in our voluntary service. Uh, we experience this while receiving correction when people correct us. We uh, experience this when we are subjected to discipline uh, and when we go through failures, when failures visit us and we go through it, uh, we learn uh, this obedient in the crucible of life, difficulties and suffering. Now, I mentioned all this very quickly, various uh, expressions of it, but they are very common. That means common to you, common to me, shared by all of us. But our response to these common experiences it's not the same. Experiences, common. Response, not the same. And we must recognize that our response would determine how well we develop in our character. When we were young, obedience means taking orders, following rules. And then when we grow older, obedience often takes a different expression. It is no longer specific rules, but the general will or the, the desire of the other person, the other party that we seek to oblige. We do not see it as something negative, but we see it as a, a character strength on our part to do that. That is how a family functions, uh, because there's this element of one's willingness to uh, do the general will, desire of uh, the, the, the family. That's how a company would function effectively, how a family would function healthily, and how a church would function spiritually. So if we grow to that type of expression. Now, for instance, in the context of the church, we behave, we conduct ourselves according to our understanding of the will of God, uh, or what pleases God, or what is the expressed desire of God. And others in the church may intervene uh, uh, in our life and speak into our life when we conduct uh, and we behave in ways that are displeasing to God. And when this happens, it calls for submission. It calls for obedience. So you begin to see uh, the, the context of uh, how we learn through all these difficulties uh, about obedience and uh, it's common and yet response would then uh, determine the outcome of how our character is being developed. 
church, church and character training. The church is actually a very good place where we can grow in our character. As a community, we nurture character development through our shared discipleship journey. Uh, the, our SDC, Simple Discipleship Church, emphasizes on character development. Uh, all the four essentials of our Simple Discipleship model would lead to character transformation. And I will make reference to one of the essentials later on to showcase how it helps our character development. So, now, now with that as our introduction and, and background, uh, I want to share with you now more specifically two thoughts from the passage before us. Just two thoughts, and uh, we hope to keep the message short. Number one, starting with obedience, but ending with rebellion. Look at the passage before us. Uh, in verse 30, it says that, Then the man came to the second son and said likewise, Go to the uh, vineyard and work. And the son said, I go, sir. But he did not go. Which of the two did the will of the father? Now, when you read these uh, two verses, verse 30, verse 31, uh, it seems to me like someone who is very obliging and obedient, but actually the second son could not be bothered. Actually, he couldn't be bothered in, in a colloquial term. A local colloquial term, we say that Ibo chap, huh? he, he couldn't care less. And if you look at the root word uh, and translation in verse 29, that uh, the, the uh, first son regretted it, or he changed his mind. And then look again at 32, about the change of mind. The, the, the second son relented, he regretted. Huh? Now, both the 29 and 30, they share the same root word. This whole thing about regretting about repenting, changing one's mind, or, or to care afterwards. At first, didn't care. But after that, he began to care. Well, so this is the, the, the understanding, uh, what, what the verse is trying to convey to us. Couldn't care less attitude, leading to disobedience and other problems. A person with couldn't care less attitude can develop over a period of time the uh, character quality of disobedience. No, you just don't care, you don't obey. Then, other negative qualities can be spun off and lead to other uh, negative uh, qualities from this basic weakness of disobedience. Uh, they would uh, include unreliability, unfaithfulness, untrustworthiness and irresponsibility. No, so, so, so you can spin off to that uh, aspect. If someone says yes to a job assignment and then later on walks away without getting the job done, then all negative attitudes will develop over time from the root problem of disobedience. As adults and especially as parents, we are most afraid of seeing uh, this couldn't care less attitude in our children because we know that uh, it can lead to very negative character qualities of unreliability, disrespect when our children grow up. All of us can start with obedience, not just our children, but we as adults too, and later can become disobedient. We start with obedience, then become disobedient. It can happen to us. We can say yes to God and then forget about it the next day. So we must be careful huh? and avoid having this attitude because it leads to the unconscious habit of disobedience to God. We do not become disobedient to God overnight. It is usually over a period of time when we sidetracked a little at a time. And that was the position of the Jews. They started as a people group that obeyed God, but deteriorated to become a rebellious people to God. 
There was also the story of King Saul. We uh, studied his life in part one. He started well as an obedient servant of God, but subsequently became a disobedient king. And the lesson for us today is this, that we must watch out for the young people and for ourselves. Huh? Watch out for our young people in church and for ourselves. Uh, we watch out against sidetracking from our pathway of obedience and then turning into the byways of irreverence and irresponsibility, where we just we don't revere God anymore, just treat Him lightly and then begin to act irresponsibly. We can go that way. It is easy for us adults to be dismissive of the need for submission, for discipline, for compliance. Well, because as adults, uh, we treasure independence, freedom. We hate control. But sometimes these are needful for the health of the family, for the health of the organization, for the health of relationship. We should give further thoughts to what the Bible teaches on this. But moving on to training our young people in obedience. Church is a good place for us to develop our character as adult. It is also a good place to develop character of our young people. Character development is not a matter of classroom lecture, but in real life experiences. We develop our young people by exposing them to leadership responsibilities in church. We develop young people by subjecting them to tough living and ministry conditions in the mission field. Uh, I told you I'll be uh, mentioning about uh, one of the essentials of SDC, and here I'm mentioning it, uh, Essential Commission, where we encourage our young people to participate in missions. Exposure to mission trips in poor countries, especially, with challenging living conditions is an excellent character development environment for our young people. We go to places where there is lack, lack of clean water, lack of electricity, poor sanitation, uncomfortable accommodation. At LSBC, we're very privileged to have many overseas mission destinations and many opportunities for participation for our young people. I personally see great value in such training and development opportunities. And I have made sure uh, that all my three children, they're now growing up, but in our growing up years, I, I, in the past 20 years, I made them, encouraged them to, to get exposures in all our overseas destinations. All three of them went to all available destinations, Kalimantan, Aceh, East Timor. And my children have gained greatly from that experience. Uh, our children can develop qualities like faith and trust in God, like compassion for the poor, gratitude uh, for what God has given to them in comparison to what they see in a few. They learn about sacrifice, sacrifice, convenience, comfort for others. They learn about simplicity. How is that when going to a few? The meals, the drinks, the combination is so simple. And then as a parent, when I encourage my children to go on overseas mission trip uh, uh, to countries with harsh conditions, I learn. I benefit as well. I learned to trust God. I learned to uh, entrust my children to God. You go to mission field, accident can occur. Of course it can. And... Uh, they can fall sick with food poisoning during the trip. They can contract malaria. The ferry they sail in can capsize. The plane they fly in can crash. All these are possibilities. But we just got, I learned. I learned to trust God. I learned to entrust them to God. So we gain. Young people on mission trips are subjected to discipline. They are not there for holiday and uh, the, the waking up time, the things they're going to do, they're, they're all subject to discipline. They're required to serve. They're required to watch their speech uh, and their conduct. They have to observe dress code. They have to respect leaders, learn to work uh, with other team members, and uh, 
basically to submit to leadership. Those young people that respond well gain experience, gain the benefit of character development. Some rebel against all this discipline and then they get rebuilt. Of course, during the trip, they're rebuilt. Of course, they got offended huh, by the rebuke. Some of them carry home the offences and they keep the offences in their heart. Eventually, some have left the church because of the offences. Uh, it's not something we wish for, but it does happen and uh, I'm much saddened by it. So these are common experiences shared by all of us, adults and young people. To respond to these common experiences, however, is not the same for all of us. So we must recognize that our response would determine how well we develop our character. So our take home for today on this point is this, that we must make sure we do not fall into the category of the second son in a parable. We're starting first part on the second son anyway. Uh, namely that we, get start, we start by being obedient and then we backslide into disobedience. Let's take care that we don't fall into this category. But point number two, starting with defiance, but then ending with repentance. We studied two verses. Uh, verse 28, what do you think? A man had two sons. He came to the first and said, son, go work today in my vineyard. He answered and said, I will not. But afterward, he regret, regretted it and went. When the first son said, I will not go in your vineyard, no, when I read it, it sounded very defiant. Somehow, uh, the sound vibe that comes out is that it's very defiant. The question I ask is whether the first son was conscious of his own defiance to the dead. You know, we'll be surprised if the son can be taken out of the parable and answer us and say that uh, he, he, he felt that he wasn't defiant at all. He was just being frank to the father. He was just being honest to his father. Very often, we can be disobedient and yet be totally unaware that we are. For instance, we can refuse adamantly to budge when people confront us with biblical standard of speech, conduct, uh, of our commitment, our attitude, etc. And then we say that we have our own conviction on the matter, we refuse to budge. Others see our stubbornness, but we see our firmness. And this happened with us adults. Uh, adult, uh, adults can grow to be fixed in their ways, and some of our ways are totally dishonouring to God. But we are not aware and we are seldom open to correction. You know, we can be also self, uh, easily self-deceived into thinking that intention can take the place of action. We intend to obey God. We intend to serve God. We intend to do it later and then, but never get on to action. We can be deceived in thinking that a form can replace the substance. Uh, sacrifice can replace heeding the voice of God. Just sacrifice some money, some time, but the fundamental area where God wants us to obey, we uh, just ignore it. So the, the root of it all actually is obedience. And it happened uh, to Saul, uh, and we uh, referred to the passage in our first part, 1 Samuel 15, 22-23, where uh, Samuel confronted Saul after he disobeyed God at the battle. And Samuel said, Has the Lord as great delight in burnt offering and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? And Samuel wanted to say that rebellion, your stubbornness, uh, 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 and you have rejected the word of God and God has rejected you. So all these words that we have been looking at nah, for today, those words like, uh, uh, what obedience expressed in uh, doing delight and obeying the voice of God and uh, disobedience that leads to rebellion, certain stubbornness. So, I think it's important for us to, 
to know the motivation of obedience. Obedience actually is a matter of choice. I can choose to obey or I can choose not to obey. Who should we obey? And why should we obey? I think we should obey God because He's our God, He's our Father. And we would, we would be richly blessed if we choose to obey. And our obedience is basically motivated by our love for God. It should be that because we love Him and therefore we would obey Him. The way Jesus showed the way in John 15, 9 to 10, He said, As a father loved me, I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandment, you will abide in my love just as I've kept my father's commandment and abide in his love. This, this love, abiding in love and obedience is all interlinked. There's a motivating force for obedience. So the, the motivation for obedience is, is important. God directed, uh, I mean, the, the type of obedience is, <coughs> sorry, that is God directed leads to growth and development of character. We look to God to teach us obedience at various stages and various stations of life. God teaches us about uh, children obeying parents, about wives obeying husbands, employees obeying employers, uh, believers submitting to spiritual leadership, citizens obeying governmental authorities, and so forth. And we re re remember at all times that obedience to God must take priority uh, to the other expression of obedience. And, you know, so one obedience, the basic priority of obedience, uh, the others would then follow correctly. So motivation is important. Know why we believe. God directed obedience. Right? Re then we must also learn about repentance from disobedience. Well, because none of us can uh, claim that we have never or we can never disobey God means that we, we have fallen into that type of situation and we can fall into a situation of disobeying God, of not acting according to His will, His pleasure. And because of that, we all need God's grace. We, we need God's mercy to restore us. And we must remember today, I mean, the, the, the take home for us is that no instance of disobedience is fatal. God's grace and God's mercy are abundantly available to all of us. The first son in the parable started being defiant, but he regretted it, or he repented, uh, he relented. These are the various translations to give us the meaning. Uh, in verse 29, he, said, uh, he answered and said, I will not, but later he regretted it and went. Right? Uh, to regret here, of course, meaning in the uh, NLT, it said he changed his mind, right? Regret, repent, uh, to change his mind. To, uh, and a tr certain translation put it, he, he then cared about it afterward, huh? is to care. At first, didn't care. I say the colloquial word, Bo Chama, couldn't care less. But he, he regretted then, he began to care again. And that's a beautiful expression about what, what repentance is, what change is. Okay, there is an Old Testament story on point that is of great encouragement to me and it is about the repentance of King Ahab, the notoriously wicked king. And it's recorded for us in uh, 1 Kings chapter 21, 17 to 29. And uh, this, this story is about uh, after Ahab uh, uh, murdered uh, Naoth and then uh, stole his land, and God sent Elijah to confront him. And uh, in verse 19, we start. Thus says the Lord, have you murdered and also taken possession? Uh, and uh, then God said, you're going to speak to him. Uh, Thus says the Lord, the place where dogs lick the blood of Naboth, dogs shall lick your blood, uh, even yours. And further down 21, God said, I will bring calamity on you. I will take away your posterity, cut off from Ahab every male in Israel, uh, both born and free. And the Bible said that there was no one like Ahab who sold himself to do wickedness in the sight of the Lord. Verse 25. Uh, verse 27 is the one that I want to bring you to. Look at it. It's fantastic, right? So it was when Ahab heard th those words that he tore his clothes, put sackcloth on his body, 
fasted and lay in sackcloth and went about mourning. So he repented. There was a change of heart. Of course, he couldn't get Naboth to be resurrected. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah saying, See how Ahab has humbled himself before me. Because he has humbled himself before me, I will not bring the calamity in his days. In the days of his son, I will bring the calamities on his house. So there was a, there was a change. All right? There was a, a, like a reduced sentence. In, in a sense, God responded to the re- repentance, the repentant heart of Ahab. It is, it is encouraging because Ahab is so notorious, so wicked, and yet God could extend to a person who was willing at that point in time uh, to grieve over his sin and uh, to repent. I think it is all right to fall into rebellious ways so long, right? so long as we repent and walk again the pathway of obedience. And that we begin to live by the word of God. You know, that's a way of an obedient child. We live by what God's will, God's word. It helps show us the grace and the mercy of God. But he is no example for us uh, to follow in other aspects. Don't follow uh, Ahab. There is, however, a New Testament story of how a defiant Jew repented and became the greatest apostle. And that brings me to my next uh, no thought uh, about from defiance to obedience. Paul the Apostle Paul was defiant to God's salvation plan. And he was totally unaware. You know? uh, Acts 26, 9-11, to uh, Paul, Paul said, Indeed, I myself uh, thought I must do many things contrary to the name of Jesus. He thought I must do it. It was the right thing for me to do. And of course, then God confronted Paul on the road to Damascus. And uh, in verse 14, uh, Paul said that I heard a voice speaking to me in Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And, uh, and God, God told him what he wanted Paul to do. Uh, I appear to you for this purpose, to make you a minister and a witness both of the things you have seen and of the things which I will uh, yet reveal to you. I will deliver you from Jewish people as well as Gentiles to whom now I sent you to open their eyes. So there's a mission for him. Open their eyes turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sin and inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me. So he was given a mission. And the, 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 it was a heavenly vision uh, given to him. And then in verse 19, you know, so after he received a vision, God, uh, I mean, Paul really went all the way out to serve God. And he told King uh, Agrippa in verse 19, Therefore, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. We've been talking about uh, obedience, disobedience. We talk about Saul. He, he was very defiant. I mean, he persecuted Jesus and the church, but he was unaware that he was doing wrong. But from there, he changed to obedience. And now he expresses this obedience. In what way? In not being disobedient to the vision that God gave to him. And that, that is a solid example uh, for us. Paul said he was not disobedient to the heavenly vision in verse 19. In other words, he became totally obedient to God in fully committed to the mission that God entrusted to him. And we see such a dramatic turn from persecuting the church to preaching the gospel. Finally, you know, I just want to say something that we must grab the opportunity to repent from disobedience. The parable always reminds me that God will give us opportunity to change, to relent, to care again, to repent from earlier rebellious position. And when God gives us an opportunity, we should seize the opportunity and not let life drift to a point of no return. It would be very sad when we cannot have the chance to relent and to return to God because we delayed too long. And this brings me to my childhood recollection. Uh, you remember I said that from the start, that's a story I'll tell you. I think that now, uh, because uh, I come to conclusion, so I'll just tell you the story 
uh, in conclusion. The vivid scene that comes to my mind uh, when I read this uh, parable is the, the scene where uh, I was squatting at the veranda in my parents' house at Prince Charles Crescent, pounding spring onion, pounding garlic, pounding chili with a granite, uh, in a granite bowl with a, a granite mortar. And I was directed by my dad to do it that weekend and he uh, took charge of the kitchen and he was trying to cook, cook up a big meal and I was ordered to help. But I resented it. And I was pounding the chili, the garlic, the onion very grudgingly. And my dad could see the resentment, that unwillingness to help. He then stopped me and said that if you are not willing, then you should just leave, get out of the kitchen. And he was so displeased. And I left without completing a job. And full stop. That was that scene that played back again and again in me. You know, I kept regretting it in the days that follow. The regret was so deep seated, I got, I, 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 this regret got carried over into the present. Huh? The regret over the incident is now mixed with sadness because there's no way I can go back to the veranda, to the incident, do the work, complete the work, and make my dad happy again. He said, oh, I lost an opportunity to make good. But it's such a small incident, but strangely, it is an incident that I would remember and brings about regret and sadness. But it's like a story to remind me. Whenever there's such a flashback, I would tell myself that I must not repeat my mistake in respect to matters that God requires me to do for Him. If I've been disobedient, I must quickly repent while I can. I want to abide in His love. I want to abide in His delight. I don't want to lose it. And I pray the same for you, that we, we can come to a place of disobedience. And then God give the opportunity, bring to awareness. People come and speak into your life, correct you, that we'll quickly have the humility, seize the opportunity to, to repent. Uh, to change, to relent, and then get back to the delight and the love of God. I pray this will happen to you. Let us pray. I invite you to just close your eyes and bow your heads. And just take a minute to allow the Holy Spirit to speak to you on this very important topic on obedience. And not just rules, regulation, do's and don'ts, but the will of the Father, the vision given to you, the, the will of God, the delight of God that you know. And you know that sometimes you willingly went against it, you refused to live up to it. And the Holy Spirit is speaking to you. Respond today. If God is speaking to you, that He wants you to stop the slight and make a turn and say, God, I want to be motivated again by my love for you to walk in obedience and walk in your delight. Take a minute now to speak to God. Okay, let's join our hearts in prayer together. Father, we thank you for the 
story that speaks of your tremendous grace and mercy to those who are even wicked or wayward, but who are prepared to repent, to return to you. You are always that loving God, waiting for your children to return to you. Father, we are just so comforted by your love for us and how much you desire for us uh, to walk in close fellowship and company with you and to receive the rich blessings of obedience to you. Bless us with the word today, O God, uh, and we also pray, Father, you bless us in the coming week. And today, uh, as we come to the close of service, we pray that you add your blessing of the love of God, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the power of the Holy Spirit into our life. And let these blessings abide with us forevermore. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, church, we have come to the close of service. Uh, I, I wish you a very blessed uh, weekend, uh, the rest of Sunday, uh, as you spend time for yourself and with the family. And uh, once a week, we open our uh, opens tomorrow. You have a great week ahead. So God bless you. Shalom and goodbye.